Good morning. Good morning. This morning I'll be reading from the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 10 through 13. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Let's pray, please. Our dear, most gracious and heavenly Father, Father, just thank you for the day. Thank you for allowing each and every one of us to be present in your house today, Father, just to worship you in spirit and truth and gather around your table, Father. Father, I just pray you be with Brother Bob as he brings forth the message. If there's anyone within the sound of my voice that has yet to name the name of Christ, just may today be the day that they hand their life over to you, Father, for it's everlasting too late. Father, I just pray that you continue to be with those names mentioned this morning on our sick and prayer list. Father, I just pray you continue to place your healing hand down upon each and every one of them according to thy will. Father, just continue to be with those <clears throat> family members that's lost loved ones. Just grant them comfort and peace in this sorrowful time as only you can. Father, I just pray that you go with us throughout the remainder of this service and the things that we say and do are pleasing unto you. Father, just thank you for all the many wonderful blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But most of all, Father, just thank you for sending your one and only Son to die upon that old rugged cross at Calvary for each and every one of our sins. And all these things I ask is in his sweet, precious, and holy name. Amen. morning we are all given two things in life there are two days that define every person's life the first is the day you were born when a new life is sparked and we have the ability to make our own decisions and live however we want the second day is when we phys- is when physical death occurs physical death fulfills the curse that accompanied sin's impact on every human what we do during these two days, we'll seal our destiny for eternity. Think of it this way. We only have one chance to get it right. There are no repeats if we fail a portion of the life. We cannot rewind any section. We cannot hit reset and start from the beginning as much as we all want to at times. These two days have been defined too, by too many people throughout history. Stories of people born into unhospitable conditions, poor, sickness, tragedies that overcome all the odds to become successful, or people born into luxurious lives, born into such a way as with a silver spoon in their mouths, only to throw it all away. Stories of overcoming obstacles through life, changing the world in either bad or good ways, but either way, the life draws to an end. We all have limits, and what we can do or what we cannot do, we choose to do. But these limits are not what God desired for humanity. In his infinite love, God prepared a third day. That is available to every person if we choose to accept it. The third day occurs when a condemned sinner embraces the gift of Jesus' pardon. It begins when a person comes in contact with God's gift of salvation. The pivotal transformation that occurs when a person changes their direction of life, and it's unique to every person and every Christian. On the third day, God exchanges assured judgment for unending mercy. Paul explained the effects of the third day in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 through 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to him through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not countless people's sins against them, and he has committed us to the message of reconciliation. Once you've accepted and acted upon the third day, we have a new direction that we must follow. We must follow a path of obedience and separation. This isn't a life of slavery and exclusion. It's a life set apart from the world that allows us to focus on the one who has the ability to save us from the eternity and destruction of all pain. One of these things we must do is partake of the Holy Communion. At communion, we remember Jesus' life from conception 
to crucifixion. The bread reminds us of his body that was beaten and nailed to a cross. The cup reminds us of his willingly of him willingly surrendering and giving up his blood on Calvary to wash away all believers' uh, sin. Some people do not believe in partaking of the communion each Sunday. Some may think that excessive repetition dilutes the significance of the final evening of Jesus' life. But did Jesus not say to do this in remembrance of me? Did he not tell us to go out into the world preaching the gospel to every living being? Did he not tell us to love our neighbor as ourselves? And if we love ourselves, we will keep his commandments and his teaching. Are we not supposed to mimic his life and everything that he done? He went around teaching the gospel and the plan of salvation. If we remember him each week when we set aside a portion of our labors, we remember each week to pray for one another. We remember each week to teach a portion of his word and offer up songs. Then we should also meet around the table, just as he did, to remember the reason we are set apart, the reason we are called to be united with him again. There are only two places that we come into contact with the blood of Christ, in baptism and at this table. If you, remember to, if, you, if you want to remember something, you keep it fresh in your mind, correct? Give thanks to God and the three days to get, give thanks to God for all three days today as you eat and drink of the bread of this cup. And we always need to remember what happened on Jesus' third day of his crucifixion. So we can open up our communion packets. We'll say a brief prayer for the bread and the cup, and we'll partake it together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for another opportunity to come back out to your house this morning to listen to a portion of your word, to offer up a portion of our income that you've blessed us with, to sing praises and to listen to Bob bring a portion of your word. But most importantly, Lord, thank you for allowing us to come back at this table to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ and partake of this Holy Communion. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, I pray that as we look down on this bread, we remember what it represents. It represents your son's body that took a punishment that was not his but ours. He stepped in for that judgment that we should have done ourselves. Lord, I pray that as we look at this bread, we remember the beating that he took, and I pray, Lord, that you um, always just keep that fresh in our minds, that we never take it for granted. We can partake of the bread. And you can suppose the cup. And Lord, as we look down on this simple sip of juice, we remember what, exactly what it represents. It represents your son's blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins and to wash away our sins. Lord, I just can just imagine as he carried his cross through the streets and as they nailed him to the cross and lifted him above, above everybody, the, the, the blood that probably just poured down from him and the drops of blood was probably equal to this, this cup of juice. Lord, please forgive us for where we sin and fallen short. Lord, I pray that we don't take for granted uh, this opportunity that we are able to gather around this table, as we've seen over the last couple of years, that it can be, be so easily taken away from us. Forgive us for where we sin and fallen short. And seniors, not sons, then we pray. Amen. Thank you for your attention. Our scripture text is Luke 22, 47 through 53. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man, man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officer, officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. The scripture reading deals with a kiss of death. 
Mark also relates this incident in chapter 14, verses 43 uh, to, through 45. Mark, however, it's a little bit more brief, the reference, but it's the same reference as it is in three of the Gospels. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. We see then here a betrayal disguised as love. This is one of the most terrible things, I think, that deal with Christ's death and crucifixion, is the betrayal. And to use such an affectionate manner to destroy him. We see in verse 46, the man seized Jesus and arrested him on the basis of this identification by Judas to be destroyed. Now there are many things about Judas that we know from the scriptures. We know that everything that he touched, he cheapened. He was the treasurer of all the apostles and he used the office for personal gain. We of course know that he went and sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. We know that Judas also criticized and rebuked Mary, a very spiritual woman, because she anointed Jesus for his death. He and even the other apostles agreed with him that that ointment could have been used for the poor. But the Bible says he didn't care about the poor because he was a thief. He also defiled a prayer meeting in the garden. Here Jesus was praying his last prayers with his disciples before going to the cross. He needed his disciples so badly, but they were worn out, they were exhausted, and we know that they had fallen asleep. He tried to awaken them on two occasions but they were just so exhausted they couldn't be there with him to help him and pray with him in his greatest need. But just as he was finishing his prayers then, Judas defiled this wonderful prayer meeting with Jesus and his heavenly Father by bringing the soldiers to arrest him. Judas used a kiss as a weapon instead of of a sign of affection. Now we notice in this section of scripture that one of the apostles tries to defend Jesus. And that apostle is Peter. Peter has gotten a lot of criticism both in the Bible and among those of us who teach the word because of the various things that he did in trying to uh, be a good disciple of Christ. On one occasion when Jesus told the other disciples, all the disciples, that he was going to have to go to the cross, Peter said, no, I'm not going to let that happen. And of course remember that Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. And then Peter tried to walk on water and did for a moment, and then began to sink because his faith failed him. And so we also understand through the scriptures how Peter denied him also. He didn't betray him like Judas did, but when he was taken into custody, he denied that he knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And we think of these stories about Peter, and we think maybe he wasn't all that spiritual of a person. But believe me, he was. 
He was chosen by Christ and God and the Holy Spirit to preach the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. When you read in the scriptures the list by the different various gospel writers of the 12 apostles, Peter's name is always first. Peter was a very special person. And we see now in this incident that's taking place here of Jesus being betrayed by a kiss, that Peter again tries to defend Jesus with a weapon, a physical weapon. And we notice this in verse 47 of Mark 14. Then one of those standing near drew his sword. Other gospel writers tell us it was Peter. And struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. In Luke's account in chapter 22 and verse 49, it says the followers saw what was going to happen, referring to this incident. They said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, and Jesus answered, no more of this. And then he healed the servant. So we see one of the disciples with a kiss betraying Jesus and another disciple with a weapon trying to defend Jesus. John 18 verse 10 says, When Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear, the servant's name was Malchus. But we know that Jesus constantly tried to remind his disciples that his kingdom was not of this world. He said, if it was, my servants would fight. So the weapons that Christians used, the weapons that Jesus used, were not military weapons. We see that Jesus healed the, the ear of Malchus in Luke 22, 51, but Jesus answered, no more of this, and he touched the man's ear and healed him. But we know, of course, that there was not only Judas there, there was a crowd there, or we would say a mob, and they were just as treacherous as Judas. And the sad thing is that this mob was inspired by the religious leaders to take Jesus and kill him. We look at Mark 14, starting with verse 48, and Jesus asked this question of those who are coming against him. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. We know that this whole plan of salvation in which Jesus would have to die for our sins was not an accident. In college, when I was in Bible college, I made a report on a book that was written and it was called The Passover Plot. And in it, the writer maintained that this whole thing was an accident. That Jesus was really trying to just deceive everybody and the plan was that he would actually escape and come back out of the tomb and, and all of this type of thing. And that his death was really an accident. It wasn't intended. But this was not an accident. If we read from the Old Testament scriptures we understand that the Messiah would come, that he would suffer, that he would die for the sins of the people. What Jesus did on the cross was a divine appointment that was given since the first chapter of Genesis opened up. And all through history we read about this plan of salvation that God provided on the cross. But then in the next verse in Mark 14, verse 50, we see a statement that we sometimes do not think about. 
We know that Judas betrayed Christ. We know that Peter denied Christ. But notice what verse 50 says. Then everyone deserted him and fled. These were the Lord's disciples. There was nobody there to defend him during the trials. Everyone deserted him. Now, what we need to understand from all of this, what Peter did by cutting off the ear of Malchus, trying to defend him, and even what Judas did in trying to get him arrested for money, we notice that the spiritual battles of our lives are not fought with physical weapons. We live in two kingdoms, those of us here today that are Christians. We live in a physical kingdom called the United States of America. And every person in the world lives in some kingdom that is physical, whatever that country might be. But all Christians, those of us that are here, and all Christians all over the world, whether the kingdom they're living in is a democracy, or whether it's a dictatorship, whether it's socialism or communism, if they're Christians, they live in the kingdom of Christ as well. Now, Jesus authorized physical kingdoms to have soldiers. He authorized law and order. It's the responsibility of courts, of police, of soldiers to defend the innocent. They will use weapons of warfare to enforce the laws to protect the innocent. That, however, is not the responsibility of the church, and the two cannot get mixed up together. The church's job, the church's mission is grace. We don't kill sinners. We remind them that Jesus saves them. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we read about these, these spiritual battles and the spiritual weapons that we're supposed to use. In chapter 10, starting with verse number 3, I want us to notice these words. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We have examples in Bible history of armies as big as the Russian army that's now gone against the people of Ukraine. That God alone, with an angel, took care of it. We know that there are dangerous weapons in the world today. And that's why all the leaders of the world are sitting on edge. We have our weapons and warfare and atomic weapons. They have their warfare and atomic weapons and chemical weapons. And everybody's afraid who's going to use those weapons first. However, we see here the weapons of spiritual warfare have divine power to demolish strongholds. We don't know how long the people of Ukraine can hold out. If they can, only God knows. But we have seen through the prayers of many people all over the world that so far, so far in many ways, Prayer could just demolish strongholds in a physical sense, but we also know that applies to a spiritual sense. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Our prayer is for every person in the world, 
every leader of every nation to be obedient to Christ. We know that that will not happen as it doesn't happen in everyday life. Everybody around us is not obedient. But that's why we're commanded in 1 Timothy to pray for those in authority and kings and those that rule over us. But we know that through the weapons that we possess as Christians, the word of God, prayer, all of these weapons that are brought out in the book of Ephesians, where Paul gives us the soldier and all the various armor that he wears. God uses this armor to protect us, and it's also offensive instead of defensive. Christians are on the offensive. Remember Jesus said about the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We're not passive. We're on the offensive. But the weapons that we use are not guns. It's not germ warfare. It's not atomic bombs. And even though the rest of the world doesn't realize that this power is available to us and doesn't even believe that it is, we know that it is. And we need to keep on keeping on. I see three things that we can practically do to try to put this particular lesson into practice. Each of us has three choices and three examples here of three different people. We'll see whose example we want to take. We can be like Judas. He was a pretender. He was a hypocrite. He betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. Or we can be like the Apostle Peter. He loved the Lord Jesus Christ. And he fought for the Lord Jesus Christ and stood up for him. Now that's good. But Peter used the wrong weapons. Today all of us want to be like Jesus. We want to obey like Jesus obeyed. The Hebrew writer said concerning the cross that Jesus was obedient and went to the cross. Sometimes I've seen it in print and even heard it preached that we're not saved by obedience. We know that we're saved by faith. We know that we're saved by grace. But we also know if we are going to please God, we're going to do like what Jesus did and be obedient. If the Son of God had to be obedient, I should expect nothing less. In fact, that's what I want to do. If I want to be like him, I want to be obedient in all things that he commanded. When he says to love, I want to love. When he says to hate, I want to hate. And what do you mean by that? Hate that which is wrong. Hate that which is evil. Love that which is good. When Jesus says to go into all the world, I want to be obedient the best of my ability. When Jesus tells us to uh, give, I want to give. When Jesus tells us to repent, I want to repent. When he commands us to have faith, I want to have faith. You know, in the plan of salvation, we often put faith at the very beginning, which is a good place to put it, because it's the basis of every single thing that we do next in the plan. But faith does not end at our confession and baptism. We are, as the Bible says, faithful unto death. Begins with faith, ends with faith, and in between is the obedience to honor and please God and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, of course, be like our Lord. Let's yield to God. You know, Jesus did something else. As I close here, I want to mention this. Of course, Judas is an emblem of 
like many other wicked people in the world that are just an example of wickedness personified. And any time we see somebody kill somebody innocent, especially children, it just makes us so angry. And we were angry at Judas for what he did. But did you never notice how incredibly gentle Jesus was even with Judas at the time of the crucifixion? At the time of the betrayal? Jesus even asked those who were invading the prayer meeting and arresting Jesus, he said, would you, he asked permission of them, would you let my disciples leave? And even on the cross, how incredibly gentle he was when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So, all of us here today love our Lord, and that's why we're here this morning. We came to worship, we came to learn, we came to pray, we came to give him the honor that only he's worthy of. If you're here today and have not yet uh, made Jesus your Lord, we invite you to do so on this invitation hymn. We have a hymn here called All Things Are Ready, and that's literally true here at the church. Uh, the baptistry's ready. The clothes are here for you to wear. Uh, if you're ready uh, to accept the Lord as your Savior, it's very simple. If you already have your heart right, if you have the faith and the repentance, which we're things of the heart. Repentance is changing your mind about sin. No longer wanting to do it. Then you're ready to go ahead and confess the Lord and be baptized. So if those two things are in place, your faith and your repentance, then you are ready for the next two steps. You're ready then to live for Jesus the rest of your life. You may be ready now, and if you are, we're ready to serve you and to help you obey this plan of salvation. Let's stand together and we'll be singing the first stanza. Mm -hmm. 